last month i had the opportunity and pleasure to sit down with the visionary composer and producer behind elusive productions john sewell and his longtime creative collaborator melissa holm we discussed the beginnings and history of their work on alistair crowley's rights of elusis and their inspiration in styling the rites as rock operas. In this segment, I hope to share with you some of my own enthusiasm for Elusive Productions' work. I frankly think it is some of the most important work being done today in Thelemic culture, but I won't just be telling you about it. You'll hear three pieces, one from Luna, one from Venus, and one from the upcoming Rite of Mercury. Here first is Uncharmable Charmer, from Elusive's 2005 production of The Right of Luna, a rock opera with verse by Alistair Crowley. <laughs> Sung 
the listless, resistless, tumultuous The actual history of that uh, involves local Seattle area OTO bodies. Mm -hmm. There was a specific body that was doing the rights, and they were doing seven cycles of seven. Mm -hmm. And they would basically just pick a, a local person who was interested and say, you get to be the god form, and you get to direct your own right. Mm -hmm. And so I was asked to do the right of Jupiter. And I said, okay, yeah, that'd be cool. And so I started reading through the right of Jupiter, and it was really neat. And I, uh, I had a really slow internet connection at the time. And so I had downloaded it off the internet and was printing it on my printer. Mm -hmm. Only I lost connectivity somewhere in the middle, and so I only got the first half. Mm -hmm. And so I had the first half of the Rite of Jupiter, which is mostly poetic. Mm -hmm. There's very little prose, and I thought, well, hey, this is great. It's all poetry, and I kind of like the tunes and stuff. And I had a little music laying around. I was a musician, and I thought, hey, I could put this to music. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a neat idea. Mm -hmm. Then I went to see Rent. Like as an afternoon matinee, and as I was walking up the hill from having washed rent, I turned to the person I was with and I said, I could do that. We're going to do Jupiter as a musical. And Weren't so you on your way from rent? I to was the on first my way rehearsal? from rent to the first rehearsal. I literally walked into the room and I said, Who here can sing? And three or four people raised their hands, and I'm like, Great, we're doing a musical. <laughs> and so we started. I can imagine the horror on their faces. <laughs> it was actually really entertaining. It was a look of, Oh, we are. <laughs> I guess we are. <laughs> no one told me it was a musical. <laughs> and, uh, but what was really funny is I thought it was going to be really simple because I had half the play. And so what we were sitting there going over, dividing up parts, and then somebody came up with a book and said, well, well what about these songs? Mm -hmm. what about the and I said, I, my, mine ends after 12 pages. <laughs> well, then, uh, I guess you could write some of that. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, but yeah, we worked it all out. We did the whole thing. It was really fun. First one we did was in 2001, and that was the Rite of Jupiter, and we did it uh, twice. It's the one I almost was involved in. Yeah, we did two performances of that, and it was really fun, and it was really fast. I mean, we wrote it like in four months. The music was written from four months between writing the music and putting it on stage. And mm -hmm. so that was, and it, of course it looked like it, because <laughs> yeah, there was, it was rushed, but it was really, it was really a fun process. And uh, then when... You know, Melissa and I got together and we started talking about doing, doing a musical again. We picked Luna, which is the last in the series, and that's probably been the biggest question we get from people: is why did you do that that one first? And it's like, well, technically we did it second, but mm -hmm. we did it because we thought it might be the only one we were doing, mm -hmm. and that was it was a beautiful piece. I really loved the parts that were written for Pan. I'd seen some great interpretive. Uh, presentations of it and I thought okay this would be a really great one to sink our teeth into to write music for and it would, if it was going to be a one-off thing it was going to be really fun and Melissa and I worked on the music together and mm -hmm. she wrote all these beautiful flute parts so again it tied in with the whole you know mm -hmm. melodic pan ideas mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah it, it, instead of seeing how fast we could do it the, the question was how well can we do it mm -hmm. and so that one took several years to write mm -hmm. it. We ended up staging it in 2005, but I think we didn't start writing until, we started writing in 2002. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so it was like three years between composition and actually staging. And then we did a DVD and that was another year before that was out. Mm -hmm. And then we started right away on working on Venus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which again, completely out of order, but. 
That actually um, ended up lending itself towards, I think, what will ultimately be better productions if, as a whole group of seven, mm -hmm. because we know wherever we pick up the story, where it's leading. Uh, and so, as anyone who's familiar with the rights will know, there's not a lot of plot mm -hmm. in there. It's a lot of poetry and a lot of symbolic action, but in terms of character development, motivation, we're supplying a lot of that, and now it's not just a matter of setting Mercury to music, it's setting a story to the show that links what we did with Venus and what we did with Luna in creating a story that you could sit and watch them in order and maybe get something out of. Mm -hmm. Has Holst's work played any part of uh, your inspiration in terms of just like kind of maybe the mood or anything like that? Yeah, the planets? Mm -hmm. I would say some, although uh, mostly I would say somebody who studied the occult for, for 15 years before they started writing this. So mm -hmm. I already had an idea that Mars was, was all about the, the tightness and the drums yeah. and the, yeah, I mean, you, you just get this sort of feel for what the planetary energy is. Mm -hmm. And then as a musician, trying to find ways to encapsulate that in music mm -hmm. is is a challenge, but it's a really fun challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say, if anything, maybe um, Mozart's Jupiter Suite influenced me with some of the uh, the feel for the the Jupiter Suite that I wrote that's in mm -hmm. the middle of the right of Jupiter. When it comes right down to it, if you're a musician and you listen to music at all, everything you hear is an influence. It may influence you as to what you don't want to do, mm -hmm. but everything is an influence. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I came into this project, it was John's project, mm -hmm. and, and obviously he's he's got more of the compositional skill, he's had the vision. And so in a sense, while I am almost as involved as he in the entire process, it's always perceived as John's project. Mm -hmm. I, I had a period of time where I got upset about that. Because I thought, I did just as much work. I'm doing this too. It's always John's project. But it comes down to it. It is his baby. It is definitely a manifestation of his will and it's my will to help him with that i i don't think i would perish from the earth if i wasn't doing the right but i'd have a hard time if john was unhappy <laughs> i have other things that and, and i don't even know if i can be that specific with what specific projects are my will manifesting because I just want to do a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm always look like doing conference planning and local events and my massage therapy practice. I have all sorts of things that fill my soul, my personal mm -hmm. practice. And I love doing the rights. I love them. I really look on them with pride. Um, I have great fun working out characterizations and plot points and figuring stuff out. And if it wasn't for your choral ability. Yes. We balance each other out very nicely. John, I mentioned John being a stronger composer and having all this great musical chutzpah, but he can't sing harmony for anything. No, well, if, you, if, you, if you put me out in front of a group, I can sing my part. He's a nail. diva. If you try and make me sing with a group, I'm all over the place. Yeah. And I just, I don't sing, I don't harmonize well with other people. Apparently I'm a soloist. Uh, but I also, you know, that Melissa pointed out to me recently that, that she can come to me with a tune and an idea and, and a basic part. And then she'll go away for four hours and when she comes back home, I've written... Uh, 16 tracks of beauty. Well, it, I mean, it sounds like, Melissa, you have um, a lot of projects that you're working on that are all mm -hmm. kind of interrelated, and, and this is like a major one that, that has to do with, that it's not like where with, with John, it's really your vision and your, something that's very important at the core of your being, it's more like one of your projects, yes. Melissa. One it's of my kind projects. Of one, one way to put it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, Melissa, when you got involved, it was early on, like just right after Jupiter, basically, or what? I met John right in the middle of his production of Jupiter, and he needed main ads in the worst way, and he wanted me to be a main ad. And I said I wanted to, but at the time I was running a local, helping run a local pagan organization. I was really busy, so I called him and said, sorry, can't do it. So we actually ended up having 
it, it wasn't nearly the way that we had initially envisioned it. <laughs> and that was sad because it, when it was sung, it was very pretty. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. but that's what happens. Uh, the flip side being, by the time uh, we started writing Luna, uh, Melissa lived with us. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, I started writing Luna a year to the day after the last day that we performed Jupiter. So mm -hmm. we went to Summerstar and did Jupiter. And then a year later, I took my guitar to Summerstar and sat there and started writing the main parts for Luna. And it's funny because compositionally speaking, as far as the structure of the songs go, I can usually sit down with a guitar and a copy of the script and start playing chords at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I, in a single sitting, can go through maybe a third of a write mm -hmm. and actually have an idea of how I want to do it. And then sit down again two days later, and then I'm halfway through. And then sit down again a couple days later, and there are just big chunks of it that just sort of make sense in my mind. I can read the poetry and I can hear what it's supposed to sound like because of where the breaks are in the words and the way it's structured and, and then the moods that are there. And we, we put a lot of thought into it again before, you know, you'll read through the write a few times and put a lot of thought into what's happening and, and what the emotions are before you sit down and write a single note of music. Mm -hmm. Once it's time to write the music, it's almost easy. It's like breathing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You will actually find that there are sections of Mercury that are going to show up in Saturn. Mm -hmm. There are sections of Venus that are parts of what we're doing in Jupiter. Mm -hmm. There are themes associated with characters and character ideas that are, it's, in a sense, it's a singular work. Mm -hmm. And so you will, if you're listening to Mercury, you will say, hey, that's a theme that shows up later in Luna. And in mm -hmm. fact, if you then are looking at the plot of Mercury at that time and comparing it with what's going on, in the right of Luna, when that theme is being played, you'll recognize that there's actually a, a juxtaposition of ideas going on there. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's all very intentional. Mm -hmm. The kind of thing that I'm hoping people years from now will be pouring over and going, wow, that was brilliant. They put all kinds of thought <laughs> and planning into it. Okay. And we do. I mean, uh, honestly, there's a lot of meditation and obsessive recomposing of things and restructuring of ideas that I don't think most people see at this point. But as the pieces progress and it becomes that single larger piece, it's going to become more evident. At what point did that larger vision of, of like a single composition kind of crystallize? By the time we were working towards staging Luna, we knew that we were going to want to do more and some of the music was actually modified in ways to make that work better. Mm -hmm. And so then there are pieces of music that are happening at the end of the Rite of Luna that are already the early sketches for the rite of Saturn mm -hmm. are going to contain some of those same themes mm -hmm. so that it, it, it's the Ouroboros as it eats its own tail. But yeah, long story short, by the end of Luna we realized we were going to want to do more and mm -hmm. we started thinking in broader terms about connecting the ideas of one to another. Mm -hmm. We're really looking forward actually to redoing Jupiter because mm -hmm. as it is now there's some beautiful pieces in it but it lacks anywhere near the cohesion of what we've done since and uh, it's definitely a standalone trial. <laughs> it's piece. a very beautiful sketch <laughs> that we're going to go back and we're going to do an oil painting over. <laughs> Here is an excerpt from a 22-minute composition around the verse of St. Swinburne, a poem which Crowley included in the Rite of Venus entitled Hertha.
you both know, I've been a fan for a long time of the rights that you've done and, and of the rights that Crowley wrote originally. And one thing that I've always admired about about the work that you do is that you use Aleister Crowley's lyrics and you really stick to that, that you're able to express a lot of creativity using that as a form. From the first time I saw any of the rights of Eleusis, I was really moved. I loved the poetry, I loved the lyrical nature of it, I loved the structure, and it was really important to me from the beginning that we not change any of the words, because that's the, the first thing that people tend to want to do if they're going to put something to music because they want to change the words around and we've gone through that with some of the composers we've worked with and they're terrific people and they're very talented and it's like no you don't that's one of our rules is you don't change the words mm -hmm. you can repeat the words you can create a pattern out of the words you can do a lot of things with the words but you are not rewriting the words of the prophet that's not mm -hmm. how it works and I mean I understand these aren't class A documents but that I think that was part of the exercise part of the spiritual aspect of, of going into it was let's see what we can do within these parameters what, what would kind of went into that decision to stick with his words? I well, guess. mostly it was we were doing the rights as they were, you know, what he wrote is amazing. It's beautiful material. I, I, I guess that's the other thing is I've heard a lot of people, you know, come to me and say, well, well, couldn't you have made that better? Because, my God, that poetry just goes on forever. And couldn't you have made it a little shorter? And it's like, well, no, that's part of the joy is, God, I love it. I love the material. I love the way it's written. I love the, the way that the... You know, a few lines of text captures a mood, and it's if it's delivered right, it's funny. I mean, there's a, like that exchange in the Rite of Soul where they're talking about no one else is going to come today. The sun's going down. <laughs> it looks like rain. Yes. <laughs> You're just like, <laughs> it's funny. It's well yeah. written, and it's creative. And the idea, again, I, I go over Soul's the other one I'm working on next, and as I yes. go over putting music to that, I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah. yeah. We know that Crowley wrote to the strengths of his officers at the time. He had a musician and a dancer, and he, ha he had himself, and he liked to talk. <laughs> um, so other, beyond that, though, we know that in Crowley's work, that there's always so many layers of understanding that maybe we, at our current level of study, haven't quite grasped. So it may not be class A, we may not be, you know, tied and bound to keep it just so, mm -hmm. but I like to think that keeping it so might, there might be more to it than we know. There are people who feel that these rituals should be done purely as AA style rituals, mm -hmm. where you go directly from the script, where you do them, you follow the letter, Everything is perfect, and if you've done it right, I've actually had people come to me and say, you know, if you do the right, the rights of Eleusis right, you can't do multiple performances. You can do it once, and then you have mm -hmm. to do the next one, and you have to do them order because that's how they're written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say, great, you do that. We're free to mm -hmm. do them the way that we see works. Works for us, works magically, works musically. Mm -hmm. The composition of the music has become the main focus of my magical practice for many years now. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, I still have other practices. I still do some yoga and I do some, you know, daily ritual stuff. But when it comes down to where my study is, you know, I, I study the mass, I study initiations, and I study the rites. And then when I start getting into the musical aspects, it's like, okay, well, when we put together the music for the, the Golden Dawn rituals, we went back to... Uh, the tonal correspondences from Alan Bennett's Golden Dawn Diaries that influenced Paul Foster Case's writing, and we included all these musical intonations that, you know, the music for the hexagram ritual and the pentagram ritual are actually based on Kabbalistic analysis of the keywords of those rituals. Mm -hmm. And so the entire musical structure becomes this huge meditative mm -hmm. process where you just keep getting deeper and deeper into the layers of symbolism. It seems like in a lot of ways just the act of producing these has been a, a kind of invocation for you. Kind yeah. of. Well, <laughs> how would you describe it? How would you describe living with Pam for three years? Oh, dear. <laughs> dear, dear me. So doing this invocation all the time of these different um, planetary energies and uh, God forms. in God forms and... Astrological energies. How does that... Like, you, you don't know what to expect from that. You know, when you go into it, it's like you, you might have some preconceived ideas, but then, like, when it actually happens, you, like, you never really know how it's going to affect things. So, like, to what end does this all happen then? Does it, do, have you found that in these experiences of invoking these gods and, and planetary energies and so, so forth, that, 
that it's enriched your life and in what way? How would you put it? Oh, I don't think it is possible to describe the number of ways that it has enriched my life. It has been, well, it's very similar to the initiatory experience. Most actors who involve themselves in a role that deeply experience that level, mm -hmm. but when you're working with an archetype, when you're working with a god form, it's an initiation on a whole other level, at least from anything I've ever done as far as acting goes. I did some acting, and it's just not the same because you're not playing another person. You're not mm -hmm. playing a person with their complexes and their neuroses and whatnot. You're playing a god, mm -hmm. some a, a creature that in many ways doesn't have complexes and neuroses in the same way that people do. There's not that, that natural inhibitor that keeps you from doing the most outlandish, over-the-top, insane thing. You just go with it. I have a thought um, relative to the earlier comment that people have made to us about how if you're doing it right, you can't do it seven times in a row. Being immersed in an archetype for as long as we do, because it starts in the composition phase. It's not okay, I'm going to start rehearsing six weeks in advance and then we'll be done. Especially for John and myself, who are so much immersed in this for a year or more. You really get in touch with what you're working with. The invocation becomes more seamless. And ongoing. It's yeah. not a thing that starts when the curtain rises and ends when the applause starts. It's mm -hmm. more of a way of being mm -hmm. for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So that said, um, I don't necessarily recommend it because <laughs> it is crazy, mm -hmm. but in a good way. I mean, I can't, I can't deny that it's been the most fulfilling aspect of my adult life outside of being a parent mm -hmm. and you know being a priest. This is it. It's you know what I do. Mm -hmm. It's it has become as much a part of who I am as being a member of my family, being a member of my community. Mm -hmm. It is, I am a composer mm -hmm. who invokes these God forms as part of the compositional process and it's just this wonderful, beautiful, moving thing. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the invocational aspect of it is also good because otherwise I don't think I would have the hubris to do it. I don't think that when it comes right down to it, if it weren't for the fact that I was spending so much time focusing on the spiritual aspects of the work, I would actually have even had the guts to share it with anybody because mm -hmm. I don't have a huge amount of faith a lot of times in personally what I'm doing. Most artists tend to be really critical of the work they do. Mm -hmm. But when you've got that sort of, no, this is it. This is really what we're going to do. We're going to do it this way. This is good enough. Let's get it out there. It's time to do it. You're like, okay, I guess that's what we're going to do then. Mm -hmm. So now you've heard my internal argument, <laughs> 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 which may be, a, may be why you know, the archetypes started being so useful to the human expression for so long is because artistically speaking, it's much easier to get outside of yourself and then be creative than it is to just take all that onto your own ego. The ego is fragile. The super ego is super. Well, wasn't, I mean, when Crowley made these originally, didn't he, wasn't he trying to do it in a way that would attract people? I mean, wasn't it, in addition to being a ritual, it was also to... Absolutely. He wrote these in a, in... 1910, and they were designed specifically to raise interest in the AA. He was trying to get the AA started. I studied this, so I can just go on. I, you, you put in a quarter and tell me when to stop. Uh, he wrote these specifically to uh, promote the AA, and then they performed them, uh, and they got some really good reviews for the earlier ones, and then they started getting some really terrible reviews, mostly from people who, uh, according to Crowley, and again, according most likely to what was going on at the time, just given the character of the people involved, we're trying to blackmail him by, say, by writing scandalous reviews and saying we'll publish this unless you give us money. Mm -hmm. And uh, Caxton Hall, the theater that he was using, only seated 100 people. So he, there was a very limited number of tickets. It was You had to buy tickets for all seven shows. And he didn't really think of them as being a success because by the time they got to the end of the run, they, I sounds like the theater was pretty empty. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell you for sure because I have never seen any figures on it. Mm -hmm. But from his own descriptions, he didn't really see it as, as a great success. In fact, the AA was dealt some pretty tremendous blows as a result of it. There were lawsuits. Uh, they lost members. People didn't want to stand too close to him. That's the earliest reference I've ever seen to him being the wickedest man in the world mm -hmm. comes from the reviews of the Rights of Eleusis. Do you ever worry that you'll suffer a similar fate? <laughs> um, you know, if I were if I were out there trying to start a fledgling order, and that were my goal, 
uh, it would be a big worry to me. But again, there's that whole, we are sort of just far enough removed that if we really do something outlandishly stupid and screw the pooch, uh, I don't think that the order is going to suffer as a result. And that makes me happy. And it's brought a lot of people in contact with Thelema as well. Absolutely. Oh, certainly. That's, again, that's one of the, the great side effects of it is, you know, the world is a more interesting place. The more people are, the more conscious Thelemites I run into, the happier I tend to be. Mm -hmm. And I, I realize that that's a completely self-serving goal, <laughs> but I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, I want people to be more interesting and more fun and, and more creative. And, uh, and if I can help inspire them to do that, mm -hmm. sweet, my world's better. Mm -hmm. As a promulgation tool, it's been quite successful, though, as you say, um, how many people have been exposed to the concept of Thelema. Um, just the Luna run, we had, what, four shows at 80 to 90 people in attendance, and there's only, you know, the local OTO body is maybe 30 to 40 members at any given time. So this the sheer number of people who came to see it, who have nothing to do with the order, who have never heard of Thelema before. So there's a lot of correspondences in the in the, in the symbolism of the rituals. Yes, and, absolutely. And you, and you bring that into the. Do you want to talk a little bit about that in, in terms of bringing that into the both the music and the setting of the of the plays? Well, if you look at if you look at the Kabbalistic tree of life, and then you look at the characters as they are portrayed in the rites, it's really easy to see a direction, a direct, you know. This represents the Sephiroth, which is the play in which everything's taking place. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, the, the setting is the um, Sephiroths were always feminine, paths were always, or the, uh, yeah, the paths were always masculine. And, and so the setting is this sort of open temple-like womb wherein all the actors are the actions that are moving around. And there's a lot of tie-ins between the structure of the Tree of Life, mm -hmm. which keys are, are involved in the development. I mean, if you look at the... Um, the transition from the right of Venus to the right of Mercury, the last piece, which is all incidental, you know, it's all dialogue, it's all prose, we called it the tower because that's the path that travels from Venus to Mercury and it represents the destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. And so there's just this sort of idea where we're taking and we're, we're including symbols that were essentially already written in because, you know, when, when Venus says it is the ruin of the temple, that is most likely what she's referring to, and we're just taking that and lifting one more veil off of it and making it a little more clear. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that that goes into it. You'd be surprised. I think people would be surprised how much goes into the blocking. And there was a, a point after we did the Rite of Luna where I was approached and someone said, there was a point there where you were standing on the altar and the nymph and the satyr were chained to the altar and it looked just like the devil key from the tarot. Did you do that on purpose? <laughs> no. And I was really? like, yeah, yeah, we did that on purpose. Thanks for asking. <laughs> and I guess that's one of the things that you get into when you're sharing the material with people who are just getting into it or who don't necessarily have a, a background is they're not necessarily going to see that. And that's kind of cool, too, because you figure, you know, they'll watch the video or they'll, they'll see a present, presentation and then five years later they'll be reading something and they'll go, oh, my God, that's what that meant. Mm -hmm. And that'll be cool. And, you know, it's one more way in which to, to communicate symbols and ideas. And, and the, like I said, lots of thought goes into it all the way through the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our final musical selection is the overture from the upcoming Rite of Mercury by Elusive Productions.
sun of night, the voice of Mercury in the universe, in the presence of the eternal gods, the formulas of knowledge, the wisdom of prayer, the radix of vibration, the shaking of the invisible, the rolling of the darkest, the becoming visible of matter, the piercing of the coils of the stooping dragon, the breaking forth of the light. I want to thank John and Melissa for sitting and talking with me about Elusive Productions. Be sure to check out their website. You can get a link from our blog at speechinthesilence.com.